Detroit were sent home hungry on Friday after more than 400 workers in more than 60 fast food restaurants actually walked off the job. The Detroit strike was the second to hit the city in over a week. More than 100 uh, fast food workers staged the walkout in St. Louis on Wednesday and Thursday, making this possibly the largest fast food strike in American history. Cooks and cashiers from restaurants like Jimmy John's, McDonald's, Burger King, Long John Silver's, and KFC all swapped their spatulas for picket signs. Their demands for more, uh, for a minimum wage that actually reaches $15 an hour, an hour, and also for the right to form a union. But in an age when unions are being constantly attacked and disbanded, what chances do these workers realistically have at succeeding in their demands? Political commentator Sam Sachs joins me now to weigh in. Hi there, Sam. Hey, Megan. So start by talking about this fast food strike. Uh, as I mentioned, it is huge. There are so many people that are participating in it. And we also know that nearly half of the jobs that have been formed in the last three years have been low-wage jobs. So it's a huge amount of people, as I had mentioned. Can you talk about this case in particular and also the, the likelihood of them passing anything? Sure. Well, as you said, it's the biggest... Uh, fast food strikes so far we've had. So it's huge historically. Um, as far as how many workers are in these low wage jobs compared to how many were striking, it's not that big. But we see something building. You know, uh, this is the fourth fast food strike uh, that we've seen in the last five weeks or so. It started in New York, it went to Chicago, St. Louis, and now it's now it's in Detroit here. Um, what 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 are we going to see out of it? I don't know, but it, you know, we it started also with Walmart. We saw wa workers striking at Walmart since, and we saw the longshoremen, and we had the May Day protests last week. So we see something something building here. But whether or not the people who are creating our laws are actually paying attention to it to actually give in to some of these demands, that remains to be seen. So as you had talked about, there was the Wal uh, Walmart strikes that we've seen. There is this string uh, of fast food protests. We've also had the Occupy Wall Street kind of protests, and some of those were dedicated yeah. to labor strikes and unions. Are the policymakers actually listening? Well, okay, so last week the president was in Texas, uh, a day before the strike. He was there on Thursday, and he was taught, and he was again promoting this $9 minimum wage. You know, we have these fast food workers, they're asking for $15 an hour wage. So we have the president calling for a $9 minimum wage. It's $7.25 or $7.50 right now. Um, so that's a slight concession towards what workers are asking for, but it's really not that much. And if you, if you look at the minimum wage itself, if it were to have the same purchasing power today as it had in the 1960s, well, it'd be well over $10. And if the minimum wage were to keep up with increased productivity of workers, it'd be upwards of $20. So as far as what policies are coming out of Washington to address these, they, they seem to fall short of the mark. And that's, that's coming out of Congress. If you look at it on a state level, it's even worse. In fact, the, the, the exact opposite is happening uh, when, you, when you see right-to-work states that are proliferating and also attacks on collective bargaining uh, in places like Wisconsin and, and uh, Ohio, although it was repealed in Ohio by workers. Okay, so let's talk about Congress since you brought it up. What poll do these labor movements have in Congress, or do they have any anymore? Well, you know... Labor put in a whole bunch of money in 2008. If you can think of the last five years, you haven't exactly seen Congress pass any worker-friendly pieces of legislation. In 2008, Labor put in a lot of money trying to elect Democrats to try and get this signature uh, piece of their agenda passed, which was the Employee Free Choice Act, which is basically, basically makes it a little easier for workers to unionize. Uh, it it uh, takes away some of the hurdles that, that businesses can put in, in place of union elections and things like that. Um, and they were really hoping that, that with Democrats in Congress, Democrats took control of the House, the Senate, and the presidency in 2008, that they could get this Employee Free Choice Act passed. It failed in 2010. It hasn't been brought back up since then. And you're also you're seeing it, it kind of go in reverse, too, in Congress. Last week, we saw House Republicans. They passed... Uh, uh, I forgot what the legislation is called, but it, it but, but labor unions are saying it's an attack on the 40-hour work week. It basically allows workers and their employers to come up with a deal that workers can trade their overtime pay for more vacation days. But, you know, whether or not it's actually giving them more flexibility in their schedule remains to be seen. Um, so it doesn't seem like Congress is quite listening yet to, to the demands of these workers. Okay, so you're saying Congress isn't listening. What effect is this lack of interest actually having on labor issues in the people that are actually working in this force? Well, this problem is going to keep getting worse and worse and worse. As you said, if you look at where our new jobs are being created since the recession, they're all being created in these kind of uh, low-wage service sector jobs. So, and these are the jobs that are now striking. 
And if most of our jobs, if this new economy in America is going to be based on these low-wage service sector jobs, then we need to pay them so that they can be uh, you know, productive members of the economy, so that they can buy things and, and generate demand in the economy. If, if they're not going to be making enough money to pay their rent, to buy gas, to buy health care, to uh, afford an education, then those are going to be real drags on our economy, and also real drags for people who care about our deficit, because you know, Walmart workers are the biggest recipients of federal benefits when it comes down to it, because they don't make enough money to make the ends meet, and the government has to come in and step in to, to fill the gap. Now, despite all this lack of attention in Congress, Sam, the momentum, you could argue, is building in these movements, as we've said, in Detroit and Chicago, all over the, the country, right? It sure looks like it. I mean, at least the labor action that we're seeing is building. But if you go back to the 70s, to the 60s, we'd have 1,000 labor actions a year. And that number has gone down, down, down. In 2009, I think there were only five labor actions. Um, but that's, you know, you have to start back somewhere. Unions have gotten absolutely decimated. A third of the workforce used to be unionized. Now it's down to below a tenth. And just this year, the end of last year, when Michigan decided to go right to work, become a right to work state, I mean, that was a huge blow to the union movement. I mean, Michigan is where privatized, private sector unions were born, and uh, it's come full circle now. And with these right-to-work laws, that's that's real danger for, for well, organized let's, labor. Let's, we only have a, a short amount of time left, but let's talk about this attack on the unions that we have seen coming from all over the place. Does a union realistically have the chance of being born in an, in an era where unions are being destroyed practically by the day? Well, that's a good question. Uh, you know, unions are losing the battle right now. Whether or not they're trying to gain momentum and, and, and reclaim the battle is another question, but they're losing. I mean, uh, we're conservatives who want to destroy the Democratic fundraising wing are, are succeeding, and, and uh, corporate elite who want higher profits and don't want to pay their workers more, they're winning. Um, whether or not it's time to start rethinking new worker models like cooperatives, worker-owned cooperatives, and things like that remains to be seen, but I, I don't think we can ditch unions just yet. Political commentator Sam Sachs always got the insight on uh, unions and organized labor. Thank you so much.